That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about the best and worst films from the 74th Berlin International Film Festival. You just returned. Yeah. How many movies did you watch? Yeah, uh, about 46, which is kind of on, on the lower end. I, I tried to practice self-care as well. Uh, so we're going to start with your least favorite. Yeah, I'll just do a top five. Uh, Number five. Another End, which was a competition title directed by Piero Messina, his second film. Um, he used to work as an AD for, uh, what's his name that did The Great Beauty? Sorrentino. Uh, and his debut, The Wait, starring Juliette Binoche, has kind of similar themes to this in Lou Delage. And I remember liking that film. But this is kind of a, a heady sci-fi film that feels like it should be a Black Mirror or Twilight Zone episode that stretched, you know, way past the point of... Uh, uh, the suspension of disbelief is uh, apparent, but Gael Garcia Bernal is this man in mourning, what he does for work, who knows. His sister, Bernice Bijo, uh, works for this place called Another End, which offers loved ones the chance to download the consciousness of their, of, of dead loved ones into a host. Uh, a compatible host that uh, the computer finds a formula for the most compatible person that's volunteering. Uh, and she does that for this dead lover of his. Uh, and so Renata Renzva shows up and uh, of course they all have all kinds of issues. Uh, but it's set in the near future and not a lot of this makes sense because you can't let the consciousness that it's the person that they seem, they wake up in another body thinking like they've just been asleep. You can't let them know that they're really dead. And you get a limited number of sessions based on all kinds of things. Uh, and it's really just your chance to say goodbye. And it just doesn't make sense, uh, considering apparently there's no social media in this world where somebody could come back and accidentally find out they died. I, I just thought it was very silly. And it has a twist in the end that is just... It's stupid. <laughs> Number four. La Cocina. Uh, the... Fourth film directed by uh, Alonso Ruiz Palacios, and I've I actually liked his past three films, so maybe I had high expectations for this. I think he took two years in the editing process, and it it is way over directed. It is about uh, behind the scenes shenanigans in a the kitchen of a Times Square tourist trap, and Rooney Mara and Raúl Briones are the, these doomed lovers. And he's playing Pedro, this guy that's his own worst enemy that can't seem to... And it's it's like two and a half hours and it, it's just extremely grating because uh, amidst all of these, this regular kitchen drama, uh, she has decided that she wants to have an abortion, but it has to be that day and she has to do it on her break between shifts. Oh. That just... It, I, it didn't work for me. Although I did talk to several people that, uh, notable people that thought this was a, a masterpiece and I, I politely disagree. Number three. From Hilda with Love, uh, the latest film from a German director, Andreas Dresden, also in competition, that I thought was just dull. Uh, but it's an old fashioned kind of story from an old fashioned director. At least it's a major improvement upon his last film, which I hated. Uh, but but it's, a, it's about uh, finding the good Germans during uh, Nazi-occupied <laughs> Germany. Uh, it, it's about a young woman named Hilda who becomes uh, involved with this rebel faction, merely, mainly because she can type, not because she really cares about any other kind of thing. Uh, and she's captured, and in res retrospect, it goes through this one crazy summer in her life uh, leading up to her capture and giving birth to uh, a baby uh, and she is, uh, as the title suggests, doomed as well. Number two. Number two, Suspended Time, directed by Olivia Assayas, who is a director I usually quite like, but this film makes me think that his uh, level of self-awareness is completely absent. Uh, it is retelling in a fictional way his experiences holding up with his brother and their two current lovers during uh, the early days of the pandemic in their familial countryside home. And it is supremely pretentious and boring, these four people who I could give up what is happening with them. Uh, it doesn't help that Vincent Macayen, Macayena is playing the composite of ACS and I found him extremely annoying. Uh, I don't know why, it, it's, it's like when you're forced to go through somebody's family photo album. That's for you. This isn't, this isn't doing anything for anybody else, ostensibly, but there it is, it, it happened. 
Number one. Black Tea. I was unprepared for how terrible this film is. Uh, it is the fourth film, I believe, by Mauritanian filmmaker uh, Abderrahman Sissako, whose last film was a decade ago, was uh, Timbuktu, which swept the Caesar. So I think people have been very highly anticipating this film, uh, which is about a woman who uh, pulls a Julie Roberts uh, runaway bride at the altar and flees to China, specifically Guangzhou, uh, and then uh, kind of explains sows her wild oats. Uh, this film has a really dumb twist in, in the end that kind of forgives the very bizarre nature of what's happening, uh, but also casts everything that has happened before in a really, it, it's really dumb. <laughs> and it, it doesn't seem like anybody's having a, a, an actual human experience in this film. There was also additional drama because it was uh, partially funded through Taiwanese money. Uh, and then this gets set in China, but it's a China, like Guangzhou is a really uh, busy metropolis and all these people are very languidly walking around. It, it's, it's, it's a tiresome film. I, I, I loathed it. I really didn't like it. Well, let's get to the good. These are your favorite films from the festival. Yes. So number 10. At number 10, I have a tie. Uh, Sasquatch Sunsets from the Zellner Brothers, which is actually a Sundance premiere, but Riley Keough and Jesse Eisenberg and one of the directors themselves are amongst, uh, this is like a Nat Geo doc version of Harry and the Hendersons, where we're following, we're just following a group of a Sasquatch clan as they're wandering through the woods and get closer to uh, the nearest civilization and their various experiences, several of them die, uh, but it's, it's actually kind of it's it's really funny and sometimes has a couple moving moments and clearly it wouldn't be for everybody but uh, I, I quite enjoyed it. Um, and uh, also at number 10, Architecton, the latest documentary from Victor Kosakovsky whose uh, last doc, Gunda, uh, got a lot of attention. Uh, this one is, it sounds like it'd be really dull and I was not looking forward going into it. It's roughly about our relationship with concrete. Uh, but it's a very meditative film. The score with the cinematography by Ben Bernard and uh, Evgeny Galperin did the score. It is, this has to be seen in the theater if you're going to see it. It's also an A24 documentary, uh, but it's kind of about uh, Mother Nature's own uh, way of shifting uh, her space around and also going through the ruins of past uh, architectures and kind of the beauty that is retained within them juxtaposed with how we use concrete today and materials that uh, are meant to fall apart and how things used to be meant to last a lifetime for, for generations and now uh, everything we do is manufactured in a way to, that, that's the exact opposite and of course there are additional conversations about capitalism's ills that we can uh, lean into there but th this is a, a very visual experience overall. Number nine. Who by Fire, Calm Le Fou, uh, the latest from Philippe Lesage, which played in the Generation section, uh, which won an award out of that. And it is, it is a long film. It is um, just a, a little under three hours. Uh, and I didn't know what to expect going into this. And it's a very strange film. It's an imperfect film, but it's about uh, a father, a screenwriter, and his two teenage children and his son's best friend going to a cabin of an old friend of his, a director who he used to work with, and they've since, since split ways. And let me tell you, this frayed relationship between these two men, uh, the director's played by Ari uh, Werthaler and Paul Amirani is the screenwriter. And as soon as they start drinking wine, there are so many bitchy dinner scenes in this. <laughs> and then meanwhile, the kids have their own kind of weird triangulated drama that's going on because the best friend likes the daughter who starts sleeping with the director, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it is... Uh, it is definitely worth seeking out. Number eight. Some Rain Must Fall, which reminds me of an old Steve McQueen movie, Baby, the Rain Must Fall. Uh, this is a narrative debut by Chu Yang, who won the Palme d'Or can for his short, one of his previous shorts. Uh, it has a lead performance, uh, making her debut, uh, I Are You, who I was so impressed by. It is about a Chinese woman who uh, accidentally causes a major accident at her child's foot or a basketball game. She injures this woman with a basketball who almost dies apparently. And then over the next couple of days, it's just kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back in her life spiraling out of control. She's uh, trying to go through a divorce. Uh, she's 
has significant issues from her past she's never dealt with. It felt like if Lars von Trier directed everything everywhere all at once. Hmm. Number seven. Uh, Dahomey, which won the Golden Bear, uh, directed by Matty Diop, at a slim 67 minutes a documentary that's kind of a hybrid in some ways because it's got some anthropomorphic tendencies. Uh, but in short, it is about the transport of 26 artifacts that were stolen from the kingdom of Dahomey by French colonial troops decades before, and they were, in 2021, I, I believe were 26 of like the 7,000 or so pieces stolen were returned to the rightful kingdom of Benin. And a majority of the film is a kind of a town hall at a university with all these students reflecting on what this even means, the importance of it, is it important, uh, is, it, is it demeaning, is it lip service, because it's really just the small percentage of what was returned. You can't really return it, as uh, I recall one of the students saying, like, you know, we're still speaking the language of the colonizers because our, our original various tribal languages, we, we can't communicate that way. Uh, so lots of very interesting uh, points of conversation. I know there was some squabbling about this winning the bear ahead of the wind because it, it's such a short running time, but for what it packs in there, I, I think it's saying exactly what it needs to say. And then meanwhile, the screen often goes to black a couple times um, and we get the voice, the guttural, distorted voice of one of the kings, the statues of one of these kings reflecting on what it means to go back to a country that no longer recognizes him any longer. Number six. A Traveler's Needs, uh, which is uh, the latest by Hong Sang Soo, which won the Grand Jury Prize, the second place prize, and uh, reunites him for the third time with Isabelle Huppert, uh, playing a mysterious woman, a French woman who has shown up in Seoul, who has a very peculiar method of teaching uh, Korean women how to speak French. Uh, and, and of course, their common language is, is English. Uh, it is a film that it has such a weirdness to it. Uh, and of course, I had many conversations with people that think Hong Sang Soo just redoes the same films over and over again. Um, but his pairings of the three with Uper, I think this is this is definitely the most bizarre, uh, but I, I loved every minute of it. Number five. My favorite cake, which I assumed would win something because its co-directors, Betash Saneha and Maryam Mogadam, were uh, are being detained in Iran uh, because of messages uh, in the film, which it, it, it's saying so much. But I like their last film as well, Ballad of a Wet Cow, which I think won Best Screenplay. But Berlin juries tend to uh, make statements with the award, so I assumed that they would be making a statement with this. It also happens to be a film I thought was uh, really good. It's about a 70-year-old woman played by Laila uh, Farhadpour, who basically decides that she, she, she's been widowed for 30 years and lives all alone in her house. Her daughter lives in Europe. Uh, doesn't really ever come home. So after having lunch with her, an annual lunch with her friends, she decides that maybe she should, you know, try to love again. And she, it shows her going out on a journey trying to meet a man, and she finds a taxi cab driver who she, you know, quite daringly for her location and age, asks her to come home with him. And they kind of have like a, a sweet little romance, and then things all go to pot. Uh, but it, it, and that sounds like a very simple thing, but once you watch it, you'll see why it's uh, angered the Iranian authorities. Number four. Pepe, uh, the sophomore film from ne Nelson Carlo de los Santos Aurias, a uh, Dominican filmmaker, and this is also using uh, anthropomorphic tendencies in a strange way, because it's telling the story about uh, Pepe, one of the four hippos that Escobar nabbed from Africa and stuck in his uh, ersat zoo in Colombia. Uh, and it's a film that if you don't know anything about Pepe, who is a real life hippopotamus uh, and is now dead, he's reflecting on his life from the grave, uh, there's a very interesting, bizarre history uh, because all of the animals that were in Escobar Zoo were taken, I think, dispersed back into the U.S. except for these four hippos, which is a male and three females, and they proliferated in the region, and now there's a ton of hippos there. Oh. And of course, their natural predators aren't there. Uh, so it's kind of an environmental problem. Uh, and at first, authorities tried to, because Pepe, the male hippo, I guess, was destroying people's farms. <laughs> the government responded by having Pepe assassinated, and it didn't go well in the press. Uh, but this film is much more complex than any of that because in between Pepe, who speaks several different languages, uh, we're getting the ripple effects on the environment and focusing on some peripheral uh, characters to Pepe's experience. And it is very interesting. Uh, and it also won Best Director. 
Number three. Number three, Shambhala, uh, which is the first uh, Nepalese film, I think, to play in competition at the Berlinale. It's a sophomore film from Min Bahadur Bam. has a great central performance from, um, if I'm saying her name right, Dinli Lamo. Uh, and it's, it opens uh, on a woman uh, that named Pima, who is about to get married to, in a kind of a polyandrous situation. She's marrying three brothers. Uh, so there's a primary, and then uh, the second brother in line is a monk, so he'll be living in the monastery, and then this teenager. Uh, the primary husband goes off on a, the annual trek to trade goods with another village, and sh while she's gone, a situation comes up with her youngest husband's teacher, because she's trying to motivate him to do better in school, that leads the community at large to believe she had an affair. And when it's announced that she's pregnant, the rumor is spread that the teacher got her pregnant. The primary husband finds this out while he's on his trek and decides never to come back. So then she has to go on a trek uh, to make it to her own version of Shambhala, uh, Community of Harmony. And uh, it is two and a half hours, but it is, it is worth it. Also, I would highly recommend seeing this on the big screen, but um, I was not familiar with this director's previous film, The Black Hen, but this feels like something I need to catch up with now, but I highly enjoyed it. Number two. Number two, Love Lies Bleeding, which is the, which premiered at Sundance. This, I cannot believe this wasn't in competition, but uh, it is the second film directed by Rose Glass, and I believe we were both fans of her first film, Saint Maud. Uh, but this stars Kristen Stewart and Katie O'Brien as a pair of lesbian lovers in 1989 New Mexico who kind of go on a killing spree. Uh, Ed Harris as Kristen Stewart's dad, who looks like the Crypt Keeper, uh, oh. is also very entertaining. Uh, it is. It has a vibe of if you mix Desert Hearts and Bound. Okay. Highly enjoyable um, a friend of mine said that it reminded me of him of early Coen Brothers, and I'd have to agree. It's got some, maybe some blood simple vibes, but yeah, I really liked it. And number one, I was not quite prepared for, and I, yeah, I, I was kind of blown away actually by *The Devil's Bath*, uh, the third film directed by Austrian duo Veronica Franz and Severin Fiala. Uh, Veronica is, of course, Ulrich Seidel's wife, who uh, was producer on this. Uh, they, you've seen their first film, Good Night Mommy, which had a really bad Naomi Watts remake, uh, which I, I liked. I, did, I wasn't as much of a fan of The Lodge, so I was not, I did not know what to expect of their first period piece, but, uh, which they've, has been in development for quite some time. Uh, a very uh, compelling central or lead performance by Anya Plaschke, who is also known as the musical artist uh, Soap and Skin, who provided kind of the eerie goth soundtrack to this as well. Uh, she's playing a woman named Agnes. Uh, also, not unlike Shambhala, it starts with she's getting married off to this man in the nearest, uh, in a nearby village, uh, whose name is Wolf. And it's immediately clear on their wedding night that Wolf is gay, uh, based on how he likes one of the other uh, attendees at the wedding. Uh, so right away, she, it's just kind of this life of misery. Actually, before it even opens at the wedding, we see a woman throw a baby off a waterfall and then immediately go to the authorities and say, like, I committed a crime. And then uh, as, part of it, as, as part of the cultural tradition was, her fingers and toes are cut off and given away as good luck charms. <laughs> Uh, one of which is received by Agnes. But anyway, it, it's, it's really a, a painstaking film showing uh, kind of how all hope for her is whittled away and she no longer has a desire to live. But as is the uh, religious custom they believe in, suicide means hell. So she's trying to figure out a loophole about how to die because she no longer wants to live this miserable life and, uh, and, and not go to hell. So she kind of does a, a Madame Bovary thing where she's trying to poison herself because before she dies, she can ask for forgiveness. But then the other shoe drops and the main thrust of the film is revealed that there were hundreds of women that, so they didn't have to go to hell, would kill children and then say they committed a crime, then they could be absolved of their crime, and then of course be executed. The final uh, 15 minutes of this are phenomenal, and gross, and weird, and depressing, and distressing. Uh, Plashk, by the end of it, reminds me kind of like the end of Betty Blue, uh, just the level of degradation that this woman has come to, and uh, the final just closing shriek before the end credits. Uh, uh, yes, I was very happy with this film. Hmm. Well, we can review 
the winners, some of the winners from the main competition. Mm -hmm. So the Silver Bear for Best Supporting Performance went to Emily Watson for Small Things Like These. <sighs> the opening night film, and she does give a lovely uh, Nurse Ratched type performance, but that seemed like such a stretch to give this to her, and I like Emily Watson. I think somebody like uh, Corinna Harfouk for the film Dying, playing a really cold mother, that, that would have been the perfect fit for that award to me. The Silver Bear for Best Leading Performance went to Sebastian Stan for A Different Man. Which I can't understand because he was the most boring part of that to me. Uh, and, and that's an interesting enough film, but I'd, I would have much rather seen Adam Pearson even getting a, uh, the supporting prize for that than Sebastian Stan. Like he, he just seemed, he seemed very monotonous and at one level in that film to me. And there were several many performances uh, in the competition, including uh, the lead of My Favorite Cake, the lead of Shambhala, the lead of Devil's Bath, all would have been a better fit for that. The Silver Bear for Best Director went to Nelson Carlo de los Santos Arias for Pepe. I agree with that. I was worried that uh, Cocina, La Cocina would win that because that's a very over-directed film, um, but Pepe was a nice fit. The Silver Bear Jury Prize, which is like third place, went to The Empire by Bruno Dumont. L'Empire. Now, I'm a big Bruno Dumont fan. Uh, France with Les Seydoux, it will be among my best films of the decade for sure. Phenomenal film. Uh, and I think maybe I had high expectations of L'Empire, uh, which is kind of a Star Wars parody, but doing a multiverse with Bruno Dumont's own strange characters. Uh, I didn't really care for it. I also felt like it, it felt like Dumont has disdain for the very thing that he's trying to uh, parody. I, I, it, it didn't work for me, but I guess that is an interesting award that uh, is probably Albert Serra, I know, is a big Dumont fan and probably strong arms that film getting that award. Silver Bear Grand Jury Prize, which is like second place, went to A Traveler's Needs by Hong Sang-soo. Yes, the Golden Bear is still eluding Hong, but I think this is, this is his seventh film in competition, and every, every time he's been in the competition in Berlin, he wins something. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not unhappy with that. And the Golden Bear first prize went to Dahomey by Matty Dia. Mm -hmm. Dahomey? Uh, yes, I... Yeah, I, I assumed that that would probably, I, I assumed it was going to be that or my favorite cake, but uh, so I'm happy enough with that. Uh, it's her documentary debut, if you haven't seen her narrative debut, Atlantics, uh, which was a can and won an award there. It's also highly recommended. Uh, she has a really good eye, for sure. Anything else you'd like to say about this year's festival? Uh, no, I mean, it was, a, I, there was a couple, uh, there was like four or five duds in a row in the competition, which had everybody kind of, uh, the, 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 like for, the, over the first weekend being kind of unhappy, but it evened out at the end. Uh, even better, Lupita Nyong'o's jury, I think, made uh, some decent selections on like, certain juries from the past, like by M. Night Shyamalan and Kristen Stewart. But uh, yeah, it, overall, it was a, a lovely experience. All done? Sure. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs> Uh-huh.